Here, come on. Come on, Stacy. Come on, let's give them a big, warm welcome. Jeremiah. And I just want to give them a shameless plug right now because it's an awesome book. Uh, it's called Staying Connected that he wrote, and he's got a second book coming out pretty soon called Freedom. And he's got some copies here available for a $10 donation. Amen? Go ahead, brother. Praise God. Hallelujah. How you guys doing? Good. Man, it's good to be here with you guys. I'm just going to smack that. That's okay. Amen. <coughs> Hallelujah. You know, I, uh, it's just so wonderful how God connects people together, you know, and uh, I just love it. You know, I mean, you know, miracles are awesome. You know, mir miraculous healings and miraculous salvations and, you know, all of these things are, are awesome and powerful. But, you know, there's th God does miracles in bringing people together, too. Yes. And uh, how many know that, that God <clears throat> wants to bring people into your life to help you? How many know we all need each other yeah. this morning? Yeah. Amen. We all need each other and, and none of us are in this alone. And uh, it's really important to understand that because a lot of times the enemy will try to make you feel alone and feel like you have to go through this alone. And, uh, you know, as, as being a part of the body of Christ, uh, you're not called to walk alone. You need brothers and sisters and you need people to come around you to help you and to be a strength to you. And ultimately, you need people to believe in you and to believe the best about you. And so God has a plan um, to bring people together so that we can uh, hold each other up, so we can help each other, so that we can encourage each other. And uh, so I really just kind of, I counted a miracle uh, to be here with you because now we get to be a part of your family. You know, we're, we're, we're plugged in with your family <clears throat> and uh, we get to share some life together. And I think that's really special and I think it's really awesome. And uh, we're, we're honored to do that. You know, last year we did a conference and um, we're here, you know, for the first time and uh, really just um, just so honored to meet, you know, to Eric and, and his wife, Carlene, and just to get to know them. And, you know, we'd known them for some time before then, but really get an opportunity to, to labor with and we'll get them mic right eventually it'll be fine and uh but it was just awesome also to get a chance to meet tom and nancy and i just want to honor them here today because they're awesome and uh, they're wonderful people and you guys got some great leadership here and glenn he's awesome glenn's the one that made all this happen anyway i mean he's the he's the connector he's the grace connector you know and uh is is, is the mic it's swinging back and forth yeah i think eric's ears are bigger than mine i think it's the problem <laughs> Just kidding, dude. I know if I crack on him, he's going to crack on me back, so I got to be careful. So is this better now? Swinging? Okay. Is he still swinging? Head banging? I thought I heard some head banging music click on there for a minute. For Jesus? Uh, man. All right. Is that better? Yeah, 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 I know. Can y'all handle that? <laughs> Man, I'll just try not to swing my head too much. What's that? Please. Everybody get up for my wife one time. Not good for a man to dwell alone. That's what I need. Brother, I hope this thing, when it gets back on your ear, it's going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? I the string pulling it, the cord pulling it. Let's get there. Yeah. Let's just do it all, man. All right. We're family now, right? Because this is like an intimate moment. It's still not tight, but I don't know. It's still not tight? I mean, I guess I could handheld it if I, if I had to. Because it's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that better? Now it's running for my coffee breath. It's like, dear God, I feel like I'm going to die. He drank Dunkin' Donuts coffee before he came. Can I, can I hold a mic and it still pick up all right? Or no? As far as like... <laughs> duct tape to my head. Hey, then I'd really feel like I was in Kentucky. It'd make me feel at home. That's how we fix everything, man. It's with duct tape, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Praise the Lord. Is that better? Yeah. All right. Amen. Okay, so... What's up? Hair's crazy? All right. How's that? Man, this is this has been different, man. Been uh 
Praise the Lord. <laughs> We're really family now, right? Still wrong? Oh, Lord. All right, I'm taking it off. Okay, yeah, amen, the faithful handheld, amen. Anyway, uh, point being, it's just good to be here with y'all. That's really what I'm trying to say, and uh, it's just awesome. And so, I love what you guys have going on here, and uh, it's very healthy. I see people that are happy, and uh, I see people that enjoy each other, and there's there's love here, and uh, there's, there's a sense that Jesus is exalted here. Amen. And when Jesus is exalted, things are healthy. When man, when man is exalted, things are not healthy. And uh, as the body of Christ, we're moving away from the exaltation of the pastor or even the church or the denomination or the praise and worship leader. How many know only Jesus deserves center stage? Can I get an amen? <laughs> He's the one that deserves it. And when he is exalted and he's in center stage, then everything's healthy and it's good. And I get a sense of that here. So it's just wonderful. So, amen. Well, let me just pray here. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this morning. And Lord, I just thank you that you give me a heart of love for these people. Lord, as you just fill my heart with your heart for them. And as I share with them, Lord, just, just grace me to step out of the way and let Jesus shine through. I thank you, Lord, that none of us came here today to see a man. We came here to see Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that you reveal yourself uh, through your body. And Lord, we are honored to bear your image. And Lord, I thank you. You just flood this place with, with, with love and love and value and who we are in you. And Lord, we just thank you for a word in due season, Spirit of God. We acknowledge you as the teacher, and we thank you that you teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, time is really valuable, and so, um, and we have two sessions today, and what God has really um, placed upon my heart this morning is, is maybe a little bit different. But as I was in prayer, you know, over these meetings, I just feel really, really strong that he wants me to to minister on this. And uh, what I really want to talk, what I want to talk about today is rejection. And um, I want to talk about uh, the concept of rejection. And I want to talk about how we handle it as believers. And uh, because how many know that rejection is painful? Okay, <clears throat> if anybody in here has ever experienced rejection, um, it's not fun and it doesn't feel good because inside of all of us, there is this desire um, to be accepted. There is this desire um, to be uh, embraced and to be celebrated. And uh, we all have that desire. How many, how many of y'all know that it feels good when you're accepted? <clears throat> And when someone celebrates you, you know, as a person, that is something that feels good and it, it really, it, it satisfies something down on, on the inside of you. And every human being has that desire um, to be embraced and to be accepted. And, and there's a good portion of the motivation of all that we do is motivated behind a desire to be accepted. You know, I think that um, when you're very, when you're, when you're very little, um, you know, maybe, maybe not so, you I mean, there's still that desire, but I mean, when kids get into their teenage years, a lot of times they're looking to find out who they are and they're trying to determine, you know, what is my identity? You know, am I this? Cause you know, it's all neatly in little categories, you know, we got the person that's the jock. We got the person that's the smart person. We got the person that's the skateboarder. We got the person that's the headbanger. We got the person that's blah, 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 et cetera. But we have these tight little categories where we try to fit into something so that we can be accepted by a group or a crowd because within all of us, since the fall of man, you know, how many know in the beginning, man did not know the concept of rejection. It was not there. We had no concept of rejection. We never dealt with it. It was never an issue. But as soon as they ate of the tree, immediately man felt rejected by God. And, and the response of that rejection was to run and to hide and to cover. Okay? And so, um, now, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, I mean, you know, God actually never rejected man. God still loved man, even as man ran from him. 
but this sense of rejection began to arise inside of man and man didn't know how to handle it and so out of a state of fear and shame they hid themselves and then ultimately they tried to cover themselves okay and so most of what goes on in the world is an attempt to cover in an attempt to hide behind something because inherently within all of mankind there is a sense of insecurity and a sense of rejection <clears throat> that I don't belong and I'm not good enough not smart enough not pretty enough not handsome enough don't have enough money I'm not enough because I mean we live in a world where there's constantly images projected to us of this perfect world you know perfect image perfect church perfect this perfect that and the reality is it's all lies because there's nothing perfect except Jesus Christ and us in him spiritually amen we are perfect in him but in in the world I mean oh, the world tries to present oh, I'm getting wrapped up <laughs> I mean oh, the world tries to present this image of perfection and then a lot of times what people do is they lustfully try to attain that image and people will buy stuff to try to attain that image people will get if I just had that car if I just had that house if I just had that all etc and it's and ultimately it is an attempt to find a fig leaf big enough to hide behind so that I can feel okay about myself and the reality is is the fig leaf is never big enough and someone always has a bigger fig leaf than what you got and their fig leaf looks better than your fig leaf and you think if I just had their fig leaf then I would feel okay about me not knowing that they probably cry themselves to sleep at night in their pillow wishing they could be like somebody else because there's nothing in this world that will satisfy your need to be accepted other than God. It cannot, it cannot be satisfied any other way. But most of what goes on out there in the world is an attempt to, to be accepted and an attempt to, um, to fit in and to belong somewhere, okay? And so when, when, when people are, you can see it real clearly, in the teenage years where people try to find a place of safe identity so they won't be made fun of so they will be considered cool and they will be accepted but then as we get older how many know life can start to wear you down and you just don't care as much <laughs> you know what i'm saying it's like you know i don't gotta have the perfect tennis shoes in order to feel okay about myself you know nothing wrong with good tennis shoes i'm just saying that now as you get older your priorities start to change a little bit and you're just trying to survive there's an element of that that's there but there's still inside of all of us a desire to be accepted okay it's very pronounced in teenage years you can see it very clearly but as you get older um, it's still there okay but what, time, what happens a lot of times is people just give up and they say forget it and then what can happen is people can hide behind a fig leaf of I'm tough and I don't care what anybody thinks about me I'm tough I don't care what anybody thinks you know I don't care and then people can develop a hardness and an attitude but really when people are like that they're actually hurting on the inside and they're trying to push everybody away because they're trying to reject everybody else before they can reject them and so they try to reject them first okay and uh, all of these things are, are attributes of dealing with something the wrong way and not actually allowing it to be fixed and not actually allowing it to be healed because that desire and that need for acceptance for all of us can only be satisfied in Jesus it cannot be satisfied any other way Jesus is the only one that can satisfy that within us and the thing about it is is it's not a satisfaction that clicks into place and stays consistently what are you talking about Jeremiah for example see these buttons on my shirt how many know that I, I this this button has been buttoned right so it's staying there right but within ourselves how many know that and, and Pastor Eric was sharing just a second ago, a little bit of grace is not going to satisfy you. Amen. The Bible says through an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness we reign in this life. And that word receiving in the Greek is a continual receiving. Everybody in here, you need a continual receiving of the grace of God Amen. to keep your button of satisfaction buttoned. <laughs> Because occasionally it will come unbuttoned and you'll be dissatisfied with who you are 
and the in the fear of man and the acceptance of man will start to influence your life to where you feel bad about yourself not realizing that the king of kings and the lord of lords has accepted you deemed you righteous approved you and said that you are good and you are enough amen, amen. and so we need a regular dose of that reality we need a regular dose of grace got any huggers in here <laughs> Amen. Amen. I kind of shook everybody's hand today, and I'm sorry. I'm a hugger. <laughs> but, you know, when you're from the South, you want to hug everybody. And not everybody's cool with that. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Sometimes you will stretch somebody from the North. What? what oh, what are you doing? You know? And uh, so you have to be careful with that, because not everybody's okay with that. But I mean, all that one hug isn't enough. Amen. Me telling my wife that I love her one time, how I many know that's not enough? Okay. Me telling my son that I love him one time, that's not enough. They need it so much that they are convinced of it. They need it all the time. They need regular affirmation. They need regular affection. And how I many know all of us, we need the same thing? Amen. But here's the reality. I can't satisfy her the way Jesus can. Amen. I can't satisfy him the way Jesus can. And so you, and here's the reality, God is never going to be mad at you. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? According to scripture, according to scripture, according to this new covenant, uh, God said he will never be angry with you. Just as sure as you see a rainbow in the sky in the covenant of Noah that he will never flood the earth again. You've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have a continual kindness in the grace of God. Is it hard to believe? Absolutely. It's hard to believe because you don't have a relationship in your life like that. I love my wife dearly. She loves me dearly, but she ain't, she can't promise me she ain't never going to be mad at me. I can't promise her that I'm never going to be mad at her because we're human, right? But you got this God and he loves you so much that he said, I'm never going to be angry with you and your sins and your lawless deeds. I remember no more. Isn't it wonderful to have the creator of the universe eternally on your side? Isn't it wonderful? It's amazing. He's for you. Now listen to me. It doesn't mean that he's for everything that we do. How I many know we can do dumb stuff? Y'all know how to do dumb stuff in Florida? Do y'all do dumb stuff down here occasionally? We almost broke the duct tape out and strapped it to my head. We could do it like this, right? That'd be a great ministry photo, wouldn't it? Straight from KY, Jeremiah Johnson. Well, no. But dumb stuff gets dumb results, right? And so God may not love everything that we do, but he loves us even in the midst of our mistakes. Can you get an amen? If he, didn't, if, he, if he didn't truly love us, then he wouldn't care what we did. See, I love my son, and because I love my son, I correct him. I mean, an expression of love is correction. If he's going the wrong way, if I didn't love him, I'd, I wouldn't care, and I'd just walk away, do whatever you want. But because I love him, I correct him. Amen? So there is correction in grace. There is correction in the new covenant, but it's always from the standpoint of your identity in Christ. And the reality is, folks, you don't have anybody in your life right now that believes in you more than God does. You don't have anybody in your life right now that's more on your team or more on your side than God is. He's for you. He is your number one cheer. You know why? Because he knows who you truly are. And he knows that you're awesome. You know why? Because he made you awesome. Can I get an amen? amen? See, a lot of times we don't know who we are. Because the world told us who we were. Our parents told us who we were. Our school told us who we were. People told us who we were. And we developed this false image. And ultimately it becomes this fig leaf that we hide behind. And we fix, and a lot of times we develop this image based on other people's approval. You know, like, you know, me, for example, you know, when I, when I grew up, you know, my parents were divorced when I was five and my mother was a single mom and uh, she, she worked hard and, you know, went back to college and, and she, she raised me on her own. And let me just tell you, I was not an easy child to raise. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Didn't always have this halo that y'all see now. Just kidding. <laughs> amen. My halo is in Christ. But, uh, and so we were, we were poor. We didn't have a lot of money. And, uh, we, you know, I didn't have the cool shoes and I didn't have the cool clothes. And I didn't have a lot of those things. And so I made a name for myself by getting in trouble. I was the kid that got in trouble. I was the class clown. I was the partier. And so it became my identity, you know, and back in those days, you know, I was born in Australia 
only there for six months. That's why I don't have the accent. Yes, I know I got robbed. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. But my nickname was Ozzy. During those time, and even when once we got married, my name we still went by Ozzy. That was my name, and so Ozzy became my fig leaf. And I was the I was the bad kid. I was the partier. I was the funny guy. I was all of all of these things. And the reason I picked and chose these things is because I picked and chose them out of other people's eyes because I was looking for their approval. Let me develop something I can hide behind that will make people like me, give me a name, and really I'm just a scared little boy that wants people to love me. Amen. That's all I am. But because of, because of the, uh, the need to be accepted, I developed a lie. And I lived behind the lie, and the lie became my identity. Amen. And then, then I, and I stood behind it, and it was based upon trying to get approval from other people. Now, if you'd have asked me if I cared about peop what people thought about me, I'd have said, no, I'm entirely too cool to care what people think about me. <laughs> Lying through my teeth, because you know I do, otherwise I wouldn't be acting like this. Because the reality is everybody does. There's a desire in everyone to be accepted. <clears throat> and then when Jesus came into my life, how many of Jesus is going to come to rip that fig leaf in half? <laughs> Reveal me in my nakedness and say, I love you just the way you are. I love you in your weakness. I love you in your trembling. I love you in your sin. I love you in your insecurity, in your pride. All of these things about you that you hate about yourself, I love you. And I'm going to clean you up eternally, inwardly, and outwardly. But then I've got to convince you of who you are. And that, my, my son, is going to take some time. And he's still doing that. Still learning to let go of these false images and uh, these insecurities. And, and you know, how many know that pride is the biggest fig leaf on earth? Amen. Prideful people are very insecure. Because, because a prideful person um, is not comfortable with who they are, and so they have to project something to try to protect themselves. And so... God wants to administer acceptance to everybody in this room. You are accepted in the beloved. Okay? You're accepted and you're embraced and you are loved and it's never going to change. And you need your daily I love you from Jesus. He is your daily bread. Folks, this is not a mental... Not, how many old knowledge puff it up? Amen. Knowledge puffs up. How many know the memory of pizza never fed anyone? <laughs> you ever notice you, you can think about pizza. You know what it tastes like. And you know it's good, but you can think about it for three hours and then not fill your belly at all. <laughs> right? So the knowledge of redemption is not enough to feed you your daily bread. Some ministers had to be careful about. Because we can answer the test questions, <clears throat> but can we, can we experience the embrace? You need the embrace. That's why worship is so important. That's why prayer time is so important. It's more than knowledge. You need, you need daily, you need your father to tell you that he's proud of you and that he believes in you and that he loves you. And this is what the gospel is all about. Because when the gospel is preached, you will be regularly hugged from the pulpit. Pulpit should not be a place where people are beaten. Pulpit should not be a place where people are manipulated and controlled and stoled from. Pulpit should not be a place where they become pedestals where the pastor or preacher is exalted. The pulpit should be a place where the humble shepherd feeds people the bread of life and his name is Jesus. The pulpit should be a place where you get hugged regularly, where you get, you get the gospel regularly, you get grace regularly. Because what the gospel does is it, gives you, it lets you look and see your Father for who He truly is. How I many of oh, God is love? You see that your Father is love, and you see that your Father loves you and allows you to see who you are. Because as you see Him, you are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Is there anything wicked in Jesus? Is there anything bad in Jesus? Is there anything dirty in Jesus? Is there anything perverted in Jesus? Where are you? You know what that means? That means you're awesome. And it means you're good. That's who you truly are. That's who you truly are. You are truly good. Now, do you make mistakes? Absolutely. Do you mess up? Absolutely. We all do. But who you are, you are good. Amen. So... Rejection it is a painful thing, and uh, it's not fun, 
And what rejection <clears throat> tries to do is it tries to attack your identity. Because what rejection does is it tries to make you feel bad about who you are. It's an attack against your identity, you know? Have you ever had their heart broken by a girl before or a boy? I mean, you know, that can be really, really painful. That is rejection. You're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not smart enough. You're not strong enough. You're not, you don't have enough money. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. And what rejection does is it levels an attack directly against your identity and says you aren't good enough. You are not enough. Now, the enemy works overtime to try to bring rejection into your life. Because if he can, if he can give enough rejection to you, <clears throat> what he can do, number one, is he'll make you afraid of love. He'll make you afraid of acceptance. Because if you, how many know love is a two-way street? When you give someone a hug, how many know you, get, you have to receive and give a hug at the same time? Hey Amen. Brother, will you stand up real quick? If you don't mind. Will you hug me? Just hug me. <laughs> I mean, oh, this ain't a hug. Just give me a hug real quick. This is awkward. You know what I'm saying? That ain't a hug because we're not, I'm, I'm not reciprocating. I'm not opening myself up. I'm not making myself vulnerable. I mean, oh, this is a hug because I open myself up, make myself vulnerable. He does the same and we come together. Amen. Thank you. And when we experience so much rejection, we can be like this. And here's the thing. Without love, you will not be healthy. Because without love, because you were created and designed to run on love. Where did you come from? You came from love, right? Love made you. Okay? And because love made you, love knows how you operate best. And you operate best when love is running through your veins. Everything out here in creation hungers for love. Every man, woman, and child, and animal, every living thing hungers for love. It responds to love because we came from love. And so you need love. But if you've been rejected so much and you've been hurt so much, you'll close your heart to love and you'll be afraid to receive it. Because when you open yourself up, how many know you open yourself up for an opportunity to be hurt again? And many of us have been hurt dramatically by the world, by our lives, by our families, and most importantly, by the church. And so what happens is a lot of times people come in, they're going to give, we're going to give God one more shot. I'm going to give you one more chance. And they come in and they're, they're almost like flowers that haven't bloomed. They're like buds that are curled up into themselves. Afraid to bloom. Afraid to open their eyes. Afraid to open their heart. <laughs> but your Jesus is faithful and tender to you. And that he will woo you back unto believing in him. He will love you back into a place of faithfulness. And he'll wait on you and he'll patiently wait until you're ready. Because, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is a gentleman, and he will not force himself on anyone. Amen. See, religion tries to forcefully build something. Religion tries to make something happen and make people believe and scare people into this and make people give and make people pray and make, 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 make. <clears throat> this is not... Our, our Savior is not a taskmaster, okay? You, love always gives freedom, and he will love you and wait for you. Amen? So to, to, to you can open up again and begin to receive love and allow the wounds of rejection to heal so that you can be healthy. Because the greatness of your life is not in the, in the multitude of things that you possess, not in the titles behind your name, none of those things. The greatness and the, the goodness of your life is based on two things. Number one, you receiving love. You need to be loved by God. Number two, it's in you giving that love to other people. The, the best moments of your life when you're being loved and you're loving, that's when you're happy. Stuff can't make you happy. Titles can't make you happy. Money can't make you. None of these things can satisfy you because love is the only thing that will set us free from selfishness. Selfishness is misery. Self-occupation is misery. If all we think about is ourselves, we live in a state of misery. Love is the only thing that can set you free from you. And so the enemy likes to develop, he likes to bring rejection into our lives so that we'll, we'll protect ourselves against love and we won't receive. 
because we won't be happy and we won't be effective Christians without receiving love and giving love. And so the enemy's always trying to bring in that rejection. You know, I mean, I was, you know, rejected by my father when I was, when I was a kid. You know, he, my parents were divorced when I was five. My dad didn't want to have anything to do with me wrote him a letter when I didn't pay any child support or anything like that wrote him a letter when I was in eighth grade he corrected my grammar corrected my spelling and wrote a small note back to me on the back and, and so what happened rejection came now when it came when, he, when it happened it didn't hurt immediately <clears throat> because you know what I did I pushed it all down crumbled the letter up threw it away and was like okay and I hardened myself Okay, because the rejection of a father can be very painful. And, and I'll be honest with you, the enemy works overtime against fathers because we see God the way we see our natural father until we renew our minds to the fact that God is greater than our natural father. But you were designed and you were built to see God the way you see your natural father. So don't you know the enemy is going to attack fathers because in attacking fathers, he's going to attack their relationship with God in the future. Your relationship with your father should be a springboard in your relationship with God because it is that male authoritative figure. Amen. And so the enemy really tries to bring rejection in that area with fathers. And so for me, man, I just pressed it down and, and I hardened myself to it. And it would take God years and years later to reach down to that wounding where I had closed myself up and bring his acceptance and his love to bring deliverance to me and into my life. Amen. And he wants to do the same for all of us. But that rejection came. And now, and then here, here's, the, here's the more challenging thing. Now, how many know the world doesn't like you? You ever notice that? <laughs> Hallelujah. As a, I mean, we live in a world, we live in, in a culture that is antagonistic to our Christianity. I mean, it's just how it is. You know, it's like that all over the world. You know, and it should be no surprise to us. Amen. Jesus said it would be that way. Okay. And so we live in a world that, that, that doesn't like us. How many of that's rejection? <laughs> you had a moment where you just didn't feel like telling someone you were a Christian because you didn't want to deal with the junk. You didn't want to deal with them looking at you, thinking that you were going to judge them. You just went in the mood to deal with that dynamic. It just took too much, you know. And so, and so what can happen is there is a constant state of rejection from the world against Jesus. Okay, it's called, it's, it's the world. It's the way the world operates, right? And so there we are. We're already experiencing this re residual sense of rejection wherever we go. How many of it takes courage to be a Christian? Anybody can float downstream and do what everybody else is doing. It takes more courage to be a Christian than it takes than anything else. Because you are going to go against the stream and you're going you're gonna to be different. And you're going to stand out. And you're going to do it for the one that died for you. Amen? But I'm bringing forth this element of rejection. It's coming from the world. But the challenge, this is actually really what I want to talk about today. The cha let's turn to um, First Peter, please. Talking about rejection and how we deal with it. Um, the challenge is when you experience rejection from the church and you experience rejection from other Christians. It's extremely painful and we have to learn how to handle it. First Peter chapter 2. This is... 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 6. It says, Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, stone, a chief corner, elect and precious. He who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But those who do not believe, the stone which the builders rejected have become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, how many know the world, or actually more accurately, the church, the religious people of the day, rejected Jesus? The sinners did not crucify Jesus. The tax collectors, the publicans, the harlots, the prostitutes, the drunkards, how many of they fell in love with him? He just could not keep the sinners away from Jesus because he loved them and he saw value in them when the church rejected them. 
Without social media, without radio, without television, <coughs> Jesus could come to town and the sinners would come out in droves just to be around him. Because there's something special about him. Because his love didn't have price tags. And his love didn't have prerequisites. He went out and he loved those who were weak and who were failing and who were sinners. And he said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. And he was readily accepted and embraced by the sinners, right? However, how many know the church did not? The religious people of the day, how many they rejected Jesus? The Romans didn't crucify Jesus. I mean, ultimately, they were the utensils that crucified Jesus. But it was religious leaders of the day who were offended at the stumbling block that is Christ. <clears throat> I mean, they were jealous of him. And they were offended by him. Why? Because he was removing the middleman. He was... They had set up a system that glorified men and not God. They had set up a system that basically stole from people. Remember when he went into the uh, temple and he, he tossed the temple tables over? And he said, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. <clears throat> and it should be a house of prayer. It should be a place of relationship. I mean, you know, Jesus came in and the, the religious structure of the day was not bringing people into a personal relationship with God. It was actually bringing people into a worship of other people. It's bringing people into a place of idolatry, bringing people into a place that was not healthy and was not good. How I many you know God's intention was to not just build a temple? God's intention was to make you his temple. He move it inside of you, living inside of you, being one with you. This is always his plan. This is always his, what he wanted. Amen. And he did not want any middleman between God, between himself and you. See, the reality is when we start to understand the new covenant, it changes the dynamic of Christianity. Okay? Your pastor is not the go-between between you and God. Okay? Your pastor does not hear God for you better than you do. You hear God for you better than anybody else does. Because God is living inside of you. When we understand that, it makes things safe makes things healthy because as I'm a pastor I pastor a church in Kentucky as a pastor my job is to point to Jesus my job is to introduce people and teach people to have a personal relationship with Jesus my job is not to be the go-between can I get an amen, amen. how many know there's nobody in this room right now that's any better than anybody else there's nobody in this room right now that has more of an access to God than anybody else. There's nobody in this room that's more anointed than anybody else. There's nobody in this room that's more right with God than anybody else. We are equal in Christ Jesus. There is equality here. Certainly we have leaders. Certainly we have people that are, that are called to lead. But the purpose of a leader is to serve and to point people to Jesus so that they can have their own relationship with God. Because it's safe. It's safe when it's like that. It's not safe when man would try to usur usurp the position of God and say, hey, you want to hear God, you got to come through me. I mean, you know, ladies and that's when all kinds of error is birthed. That's when horrible things happen and bad things happen and people are controlled, manipulated, used, stolen from, and they become building blocks in someone else's building as opposed to be organically grown in the kingdom of God as fruit on the vine, having a relationship with God themselves. Can I get an amen? Does not mean that I'm anti-pastor. Does not mean that I'm anti-church. Does not mean that I'm anti-structure. How many of y'all thank God we can all come together this morning? Thank God we can come together. Thank God we can congregate. Thank God we can encourage each other. God is the one that set forth the church and said, and to have leaders. Amen. But because leadership has been abused, people are scared and they don't want to come back because they've been hurt so bad. They've been rejected. But God, our God is amazing and he's looking to minister healing and to bring, bring uh, Jeremiah 23 to bring pastors after his own heart they're going to minister to the people in righteousness so Jesus came and the, and, the, and the religious people of the day they rejected him and ultimately they were the one that called for his crucifixion now so today we are living in a time of you know and, and, and it reminds me of uh, it reminds me of, of Jeremiah 1 9, and I'm just going to read this to you. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 10. See, I have this day set you over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. I mean, we are living in a time of reformation. There's great reformation. How I many know God has his church at large under construction? We got all these world events going on, and God's going to say, Time out, we're going to work on the church, and we're going to reconfigure things. 
And but then this is what's happening. <clears throat> the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, is being properly set in place so that we can build upon him and not build upon a person or a denomination. <clears throat> Amen. And so, this is what God is doing. But here's the thing, folks. When you, and this is what I want to, I'm just, and I'm going to close here and we'll, we'll pick up at our session after lunch. But when you embrace Jesus as your cornerstone, as, as the finished work of the cross is the foundation of your life. How many of y'all have done that? You know, many of us, we've labored for years. I spent 14 years in legalism. Not understanding the finished work. Not understanding the gospel. Working really, really hard. Wood, hay, and stubble. I didn't understand. I'm not saying all that's to waste. Not saying all that's bad. How I many know oh, God still worked through us in the midst of all that? But there's a better way. And it's Christ-centered. And, and so <clears throat> when we receive and we embrace Jesus and embrace the finished work of the cross, embrace the gospel, understand that we're in a covenant that's based on grace and not works. Can I get an amen? When you understand these things and you start to embrace these things, you start to move forward, you really become an enemy to the kingdom of the devil. Because the devil does his best work in church. Does his best work through religion, through man-made religion. You know, I was an atheist until I was 19 years old. You know what kept me an atheist? Christians. Anybody in here ever had anybody act like they were better than you? Did it feel good? Did it make you want to draw near to God? <laughs> And so, you know, I, I, it, kept me, it kept me an atheist for a lot of years because I saw these Christians. All they did was condemn me, judge me, and act like they were better than me. It didn't make me want to know God. I mean, I was not seeing Christ in them. I was seeing that veil of religion. And, and so the enemy does some of his best work through religion because religion is always in the business of excluding. Man-made religion, excluding. You're not good enough. You're not holy enough. You're not righteous enough. You're not good enough. And so people come in, and they just want to get closer and closer and closer and closer to the holy of holies. Okay? And a lot of times, your, your worth is judged by where you sit. This row is more holy than this row. <laughs> this row is more holy than this row. <laughs> This row is more holy than this row. Y'all ever experienced that before? <laughs> and then the people who are not even in the church, how I many know those people, those those people aren't nearly as good as we are because we go to church. <laughs> I'm a church goer, you know. I'm awesome, you know. And so the whole thing is set up on a scale of rejection. Amen. And how I many know Jesus came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord? Actually, this message is the opposite of rejection, it's acceptance. Because God has taken care of the sin of the entire world through the cross. And, uh, and the gospel in our lips is the message that is that be ye reconciled. Because God loves you, and he's put your sin, on, he's put your sin away from you. How I many of oh, that message is not just to the people in the church, that's the message to the whole world. That's the way it's the gospel, that's the way it's the good, we got good news, folks. God's not mad. Not only is he not dead, he's not mad. <laughs> Amen. We need people need to know both, don't they? Praise God for knowing He's not dead, but He's alive and He's not mad, and He's actually in love with the whole world, and He wants His He wants He wants them to come home. He's not going to make them; He's going to invite them. Amen. But when we have this, when the cornerstone is off, and Jesus Christ isn't set as the cornerstone, the foundation of the church, man-made religion forms in in a sense of wood, hay, and stubble, and it's all based on the works of men, self-will, self-righteousness, and it presents. The church is not a place of love and acceptance, but it presents a place of rejection. And if you work real hard, someday you might make it to second row. <laughs> because the anointing is here. And the closer you are to the pastor, that is the more, you know, you're holier and more. And it's, you know what it is? It's idolatry. Yes, the pastor, it, you know, I stand before you today, and the only reason I'm ministering to you is not because I earned it or deserved it. It's because God chose to save a drug addict, alcoholic, atheist that was a lunatic and <laughs> depressed and suicidal and ready to kill himself. And God reached down the barrel and saved me. So as I'm, as I'm ministering to you, I'm ministering out of a gift that I did not earn and I did not deserve. And the purpose of this gift 
is not to glorify me, but to serve the body of Christ because I'm thankful I'm saved. I'm grateful that I'm saved. Occasionally amazed that I'm saved. <laughs> you know? And, and that way Jesus is glorified and not the minister. But you see when that cornerstone is off and it builds this atmosphere of rejection that what ends up happening is people get glorified and not God. And you know what? The lost don't want to have anything to do with the church because it's just another club where you got to pay your dues and you got to try to earn a position. There's plenty of that out there. The church needs to be a hospital. It needs to be a safe place where people can come in. Can I, can I get an amen? And so, but, so, what, what's happening here is a threat to the enemy's kingdom because the enemy does his best work when he weaves his devices with good people, with good intentions, but wrong doctrine. How many know Saul of Tarsus was not a bad man? He was an ignorant man. You may have ever been a Saul before? You run around persecuting Christians or persecuting those that understood grace? How many know he did it in ignorance? Just didn't know. How many know we probably most of us at one time was that person? That legalistic jerk. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> that, you know, that person that <clears throat> just going around judging everybody, trying to change everybody. Oh, yeah. Amen. How, how, how much success did you have in that? <laughs> Not much, huh? Because <laughs> it's not your calling. Amen? Not called to change people. We're called to love people. The love of God changes people. But so the enemy does his best work when he takes something that's good and you not, and puts a twist on it. You know, I mean, you know, Saul did great damage to the early church. The Bible says breathed out slaughtering. So I mean, he was public enemy number one to the church. Because man-made religion was united with ignorance with tremendous zeal. You ever notice how a lot of times legalists can, can almost shame us with their zeal? But their zeal isn't born of love. Their zeal is born of selfishness and self-preservation and self-promotion. It's all fleshly zeal. Amen. Um, and so the enemy does a lot of damage through that. And so when you begin to embrace the gospel and Jesus comes to center place in your life and Jesus is center place in your church and center place in your ministry, you, you become a weapon that's going to counteract what the enemy's doing. Because here's the reality. When people see Jesus, they fall in love. Amen. You can't resist Jesus. Mm -mm. He's everything you've ever wanted. He's everything. No one can resist Jesus when he's revealed. The challenge is he's chosen to reveal himself through the church. And because of condemnation and religion and legalism, he's been veiled. People haven't seen the Christ or heard the good news. What they saw was judgment and moralism. See, I'm not preaching to you a message of moralism today. You just gotta call, you gotta calmly pause and let that sit when you say that, make that statement. I'm preaching a message of forgiveness because you're forgiven first. If you have to earn forgiveness, then we're all in trouble. You preach forgiveness first. You know, when Jesus caught the woman caught in the act of adultery, he didn't come up and try to correct her behavior first, did he? That's not the first thing he did. I mean, that's what the church does. What you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is bad. You're horrible. You're a bad person. And then there she lays. She never gets back up. She never changes. Everybody stones her and she dies. Her reputation is destroyed. There's no redemption. There's no restoration. There was no grace. Jesus comes in the midst of her sin and says, neither do I condemn you. He gives her the gift of condemnation, the gift of forgiveness first without asking her to change at all. He meets her as an adulteress and says, I forgive you. And it is that power and that love and that grace that it gives her the value of her identity so that when she stands up, he can make the second statement to her, go your way and sin no more. But he, forgive her, he forgave her first. 
See, the enemy has veiled the Christ by saying the Christ. Jesus is running around telling everybody, you need to quit doing that. You need to stop doing that. You need to quit smoking. You need to quit drinking. You need to quit doing that. You need to quit doing that. You need to quit doing that. You need to stop. You, you, you. Don't, 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 don't. I'm not an advocate for sin. How I many know sin destroys people's lives? But ladies and gentlemen, until you know that you're loved and forgiven in the midst of your sin, you will never want to change. And you'll only change for somebody else. And if you change for somebody else, you only stay changed when you're around them. You only really change when you want, when you recognize that you are better than that and you have greater value than that and you change from the inside out. And so this message that we preach is a message of forgiveness. We go to the drug addict. We go to the alcoholic. We go to the adulteress. We go to the liars, the cheats, and we say, you are forgiven. God loves you. You have value. First, no strings attached, no fine print. And then out of that place, <coughs> they arise and begin to live a life that is not dominated by sin because they recognize that who they are is better than that. When they recognize, I am not a drug addict, I am not an alcoholic, I am not, I am a child of the one true king. Amen? And they start to arise. Amen? And so the enemy tries to veil the gospel with a message of moralism. He tries to do it and tries to make us look like judgmental, angry people that are looking to reject everybody, which is the opposite of our calling. We are, in, we are actually ministers of reconciliation. Amen? So... When you get a hold of grace and Jesus becomes your cornerstone and you embrace him, and I'm really trying to get in close here, how I many know a lot of times you can become rejected by the church? And this is what you have to learn how to deal with. Because you're already experiencing the rejection you've experienced in your life. Boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, father, mother, friends, family. That rejection, which is painful enough as it is. <clears throat> and then you become a Christian, you have this residual, constant rejection from the world. And then all of a sudden, you grab a hold of the cornerstone, and the church will cast you out. That's a lot of rejection for somebody to handle, isn't it? Yeah. Let's read it real quick. It says... The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. <coughs> a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. When you embrace Jesus as your cornerstone, and when you plant your life solidly upon his foundation, the church many times will reject you. <coughs> because, listen to me folks, the church is still offended at Jesus. The, the church is still offended at the cross. The cross is offensive. It's the best news in the world, but it's the worst news to your pride. It's very offensive to your pride. Sorry that Dunkin' Donuts coffee is attacking me right now. <laughs> it was worth it, though. It was so good. We don't have a lot of Dunkin' Donuts in Kentucky, so I enjoy it when I'm down here. Um... When you embrace him and that rejection and that attack comes and you already experienced all this other rejection because there's an offense to the cross, there's an offense to Jesus, there's an offense to the Christ. It's the best news in the world, but it's the worst news to your pride. And here's the issue. How many know that there's no one in here, there's nothing that comes from God that you earn? It's a real challenge because we live in a world where we earn everything. Everything's earned in the world. It's, we live in uh, meritocracy. Merito merit, how do you pronounce it? Somebody help me. Meritocracy. Merit. Everything's based on merit. Everything's based on performance. Okay? But the kingdom of God is based on grace. It's the complete opposite. Everything that comes from God is free. It's undeserved and it's unmerited and it's unearned. Okay? Now, how I many that's great news? Because that means everybody in here is equally qualified to receive everything that God has. All of his promises are yes and amen in him. Every single promise are yes and amen in Jesus. That means healing. That means financial provision. That means protection. That means wisdom, relationships, all of these things. They're all his. And he's given to you 
for free. Everybody say for free. You cannot put a price tag on what God has made free. Either Jesus paid it all or he didn't pay any at all. How I many he paid it all? And so this 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 issue, this is why the cornerstone is so offensive. Because how I many know man wants to put price tags on what God has made free? Man wants to charge admission. <laughs> Come see Jesus. You know, you just get to pay a little bit. Come in free initially. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm sorry. Amen. But and they want to put price tags on it, and you can't do that. Okay? It's all for free, it's unmerited, it's un it's unearned, it's undeserved, okay? And so what that does is it brings all of us to a place of equality, and now our relationship with God is based on a gift rather than a wage. Okay? Now, this is wonderful news, isn't it? But, how many know it was wonderful news for the 11th hour worker to receive a full day's wage that he did not earn? We're living in the days of the 11th hour worker. 11th hour worker promotions happening all the time. Okay? But, who got mad? The first hour worker. Why? Because he didn't work his butt off for the same pay. And so when, it, when, when, when everything, and, and this is an example of the kingdom of God, and then they line them up. And the first, the 11th hour worker's rewarded first. First hour worker gets up bringing a merit mentality, thinking I've earned more than this guy's earned. So when I get here, I'm going to get at least double or triple, and then he gets the same pay. What happens? He gets offended, he gets mad, and he brings an accusation against the master. This is, once again, the offense of the cross. And that's why Jesus said the harlotans and publicans come into the kingdom before the Pharisees and Sadducees. Because the harlotans and publicans are not trusting in self-righteousness, they're trusting in Christ's righteousness. The Pharisees and Sadducees says, well, if anybody's going to be holy and righteous and promoted, it's us because we're awesome. <laughs> How I many of they didn't realize that they were the sickest ones among the bunch? There's nothing sicker than self-righteousness. And the challenge of self-righteousness is it, it tries to hide. Self-righteousness is what crucified Jesus, not immorality. And so, 11th hour worker gets up there. Now, who's more thankful, the first hour worker or the 11th hour worker? He's more thankful, right? Which one has a better opinion of his master? Which one's going to tell everybody about how awesome his master is? Which one's going to be more thankful? Which one's going to be happier? The 11th hour worker, right? Now here's the reality, folks. The 11th hour worker and the first hour worker, it's not how long you've been in the field. It's the attitude of your heart. We can all be the 11th hour worker. But you're going to have to rip up your contract. You're going to have to rip up the things that you feel like are owed to you. Because I'm here to tell you right now, God owes you nothing. But he will give you everything for free. <laughs> Amen. But you got it. You, once you get to the front of that line, you got to rip up your contract and say, I am going to trust in the goodness of my master, not the goodness of my labor. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, <clears throat> when you embrace the cornerstone, you embrace Jesus. How I many of oh, this is offensive to the church? Because the church has, has, has labored and built itself on a first-hour worker mentality. Right? And so, and we've been talking about it, and it's, it's based on rejection. It's based on earning. It's based on deserving. We're, you know, we're, we're hopping rows here with our obedience and all of this type of stuff, right? So in the times we're living in, once again, Jesus has turned the temple tables over with the gospel, with his amazing grace, and now people are scrambling and they don't know what to do because the hierarchies are changing. The pyramid schemes are falling. And people are not real sure what's happening. Well, Jesus is cleansing the temple again before his return. Remember he always cleansed the temple before he came? So this is what's happening. And so now, how do we handle this rejection? Man, it's the way we handle everything. Philippians chapter 3, and we close. Y'all get anything out of this today? We'll close right here. Because you got to, you got to learn how to handle rejection. Because it's not going to stop. You're not going to have a time in your life where everybody accepts you. You ever notice the politicians are never successful at that? You ever notice no one is ever successful in that? You are not going to make everybody like you. And if you, do, if you try to, you will be miserable and you will lose who you are. How I many of oh, man-pleasing is a horrible disease? 
It's horrible. Religion fosters it, encourages it, and develops it. But it will put the, the fear of man is one of the greatest snares of bondage that you can ever endure. Only the gospel, only Jesus will, will cut that noose off your feet and say, I accept you just the way you are. Amen. You don't have to compete for people's vote. You don't have to compete for people's approval. I approve you and I love you just the way you are. It'll set you free. But it's a button that you got to keep buttoned because it always tries to unbutton. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you, well, I've arrived and I'm awesome and I don't care what anybody thinks about me. No, man, I still deal with that stuff. It's a part of being human. I still need to feed regularly on Jesus and his grace. I need my daddy to say, hey, I love you, son. I need that <laughs> regularly, cause, and we all do. If anyone pretends like they don't, they lying. Do you understand they lying? Do y'all got that down here in Florida? <laughs> okay. Amen. So in, how do we handle this rejection, okay? Because it's not, we have to learn how to handle it because it's not going away. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yes, indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that was through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith now Paul earlier in this Philippians lays out his pedigree he said I, I did this and I did that and I had this and I had that and I was this how many know that when you really embrace Jesus and he becomes a cornerstone of your life you got to walk away from some stuff titles positions honor good opinion of people reputation I mean, you basically, I know we did, we lost everything when we embraced the gospel. We served for 14 years in the church. We literally lost everything. Lost the home we lived in, lost all our financial stuff, all of our friends that we had spent 14 years with, my, our, our, our friends, my son's friends, everyone. Everyone rejected us when we embraced Jesus. Because the church, the religious church is threatened by the cornerstone. Big time. And they should be because the cornerstone is, it, I mean, oh, his kingdom comes to grind down the kingdoms of the earth. And this, this, there's, there, there's, a, there's a religious church that is not the kingdom of God. It's a demonic meld between something that's good and the enemy trying to use twisted doctrine. That's why the church does a lot of damage. The religious church. Please understand I'm not anti-church. Amen. But I am anti-religious church because it hurts people and destroys people's lives because it's not about Jesus. It's about people. Amen. We need Jesus back in his church. <laughs> That's what we need. And so, and so he says, so Paul makes this statement. How I many you know Paul lost a lot of stuff? He lost everything. But I love what he says. <laughs> Praise God, man. I mean, he said, he's calling. It's okay. It happens to me too. We've all, have y'all, anyone ever had a phone ring in the service? Amen. Just thank God you didn't have that funky club beat and we could all like, we all just take just a moment. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to relate to you because it's happened to me too. Amen. It's happened to all of us. I don't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, you know, Paul lost everything. I mean, Paul lost friends, lost family. I mean, people wanted to kill him because of the cornerstone. But he made this statement. He said, I count it all but rubbish. I count it all but done. How many know Jesus is worth it? We lost, we lost everything. But you know what? It's worth it to know that God loves me. It's worth it to know that I'm forgiven. It's worth it to know my Savior. And so now we've lost, we lost but, how many, but God's building it back, and God's bringing it back, and God's rebuilding the building, but now he's rebuilding it on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And now what's being built is not wood, hand, stubble, it's silver, gold, and precious jewels because the motivation for service is right as opposed to the selfish motivation of self-promotion and all that type of stuff. And so he says, I count it all but done that I may win Christ. And, and you know, when you, when you hear Paul talk about Jesus, I mean, you can almost sense him tearing up. You can almost sense the emotion. How I many of Paul had fallen in love with Jesus? He counted, he, and so what happens is, is 
we, we feed on Jesus as our acceptance. And Jesus comes to this place of fulfillment. As the world rejects us, as the religious church at large rejects us, as we experience rejection, we run into the arms of our Savior. And he accepts us and he strengthens us. How many know there was a time in Paul's life when all forsook him? But the Bible says, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. As you preach this gospel, as you live this gospel, you will have moments where you feel like you're alone. But I'm here to tell you right now, the Lord is standing with you and the Lord is strengthening you. I mean, there was a time when everybody, even, even the close people to Paul, Barnabas, Peter, guys that walk with Jesus, I mean, they, they, they walked away and went with the circumcision. What did Paul do? He stood alone, but not alone. He stood with Jesus. And in the arms and the acceptance of his Savior, he had the strength to resist the opinions of men. He had the strength to, receive, to, to resist the rejection of men. Because how many know they were ready to reject? When those from James came, they brought in fear. Here is Paul eating with the Gentiles. Everybody's freaked out. Barnabas freaks out. Peter freaks out. And there's Paul saying, these guys aren't dirty, they're not bad. And y'all need to try some of this bacon because it's good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I just convinced they were eating bacon when, they, when those from James came busting in the door, you know. What are y'all doing? We smell something in here. Paul's like, this stuff's good, man. <laughs> New covenant, baby. <laughs> Amen. And so your strength uh, in the midst of all this rejection, once again, is your Savior. Amen. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, he'll, he'll strengthen you and he'll teach you how to, how, how to live your life and not have to have that approval from people. Not have to, not need it, not hunger for it, not to where, you know, because I mean, it's unhealthy to constantly seek other people's approval. It's unhealthy, man. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need each other and we don't need accountability and we don't need approval from each other. How I many do we need that? But I'm telling you, there's a fountain of living water that will satisfy your thirst for love, for acceptance, and his name is Jesus. And he will satisfy you in a way that nobody else can. And it's extremely important. Now, when y'all come together and you meet together, how I many know then you can strengthen each other? You can improve each other. You can confirm each other. And that's extremely important. But you're not going to be able to take away the rejection. Because if you, if you, if you, we cannot, I'm trying to sit this down so I'll shut up. <laughs> we cannot, tempt, we can't get rid ourselves of the offense of the cross. I mean, you can't water this gospel down. It's a big deal. You, you could water it down and satisfy people and insult the cross.